And I'd actually like to start by simply asking our, our panelists to introduce themselves. Then I have a bunch of questions. If anybody in the audience has a question, you can just raise your hand and they'll bring a notepad to you and um, write them down. And then some, by some mechanism, they'll find their way up here. And, um, and some of them we can use up here. So if you'd like to start, Greg. Sure. I'm Greg Crow Hartman. I work for Linux Foundation. I do drivers, devices, uh, USB maintainer. I also do the stable tree, the stable kernel releases, and as well as the staging tree, which is the most bizarre, crazy code, so the two extremes in the kernel. Okay. Um, I'm Will Deacon. I work for ARM. I uh, prim primarily work on the low-level architecture stuff, so I'm really into memory ordering and the, the really low-level TLB maintenance, all that kind of stuff that most people hate. Um, I co-maintain the ARM64 ports, and I also maintain the, some of the perf backends and the IOMMU driver for ARM. Uh, I'm Sebastian Hesselbart. I'm a uh, um, hobbyist attendant here at the uh, discussion. Um, I started working mainline Linux about a year ago, and uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Peter Felstra. I am the scheduler maintainer, a perf maintainer, a locked up maintainer, all co-maintained with Ingo. Um, I work on the memory subsystem. I do IRQs, I do timers, I do architecture low-level stuff for various architectures whenever I have to. Um, I get around a bit, I don't know. And I work for Red Hat. Okay, well, on the program, as I recall, the, the subtitle on this session was embedded in the core or something like that. So I'd like to start by talking about where the two of those come together. If you look at the, the contributions to the kernel, you see a huge amount coming now from the mobile, the embedded world, mostly in the ARM subtree and so on. If you look at who's contributing to the core kernel, like the scheduler stuff under the kernel and MM directories, what you see are companies like Red Hat, like IBM, like so on. You don't see much yet from that community in the core kernel. So I'm curious about what we think about how those two communities are coming together, especially now that the, the embedded world is driving changes towards the core kernel. Are we able to work together and make one kernel that works for everybody? Sure, it's a fun <laughs> exercise. I mean, scaling from the tiny little machines to the Silicon Graphics type systems out there. Is, uh... All right, well, Peter, I'll, I'll ask you this because I've heard frustrations from people on the ARM side saying they're having a hard time getting scheduler changes even looked at, much less merged. Ah, so what's well, going on there? <laughs> 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 so what I want to avoid is having a scheduler for every architecture out there. Um, and in particular, we're talking about power aware scheduling, which is pretty um, high on the list for, for the mobile devices, which are battery driven. Um, then there's the various architectures that are interested in, predominantly Intel and, and, and ARM uh, are pushing this. Um, and I'm missing a general overview. I mean, we've got the various subsystems that do do power, like CPU idle, CPU frequency, and the scheduler. Um, and all of them must work together to manage the power planes of the actual CPU and, and how you distribute tasks on that. And, and I would like a coherent uh, approach, a coherent framework for all of that, um, and not just um, random tweaks here and there. And it's, it's been rough, but um, I think it should be possible. And we've got a mini summit on this tomorrow somewhere, so. I think I'd add that uh, it's not just MAM and it's not just mobile as well that are interested in the, the power wear scheduling. Certainly there's a, a big representation there, but there are people from you know, IBM, people from Intel who are really in that discussion. Yeah, there you are. Know, they also want this stuff perhaps for data center or other so, workloads. Yeah, but for the data center, it's, it's, it's difficult to get a straight answer <coughs> on what they actually need. Mm -hmm. um, at one point they say, well, just get the NUMA bits right. Packing tasks doesn't really matter all that much. At the other hand, they say, well, we need to manage idle times, but because they've got shared, and they cannot power down the memory buses until all cores are down. It makes things a whole lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's interesting in that you get the various hardware vendors together and they don't really want to talk to each other. Um, <laughs> Um, They're also not used to talking to each other, though, right? So yeah. So, but you hide away in your arch directory because you know that it's familiar faces. You can probably move code quicker in there. 
and maybe you can solve half the problem there. And yeah, I mean, that's why companies start off doing drivers because they're self-contained and easy. They don't have to worry about. And then once you start realizing you have other issues that are cross company and whatnot, you move into the core and it's harder to change the core because everybody relies on it. So it kind of should be hard. And it's just, so it's that migration over time. If you saw Intel used to not contribute to the core kernel at all. It's taken them a number of years. Same thing with IBM. It just takes time. The companies realize that they can. They can involve with the community. They realize how to work together and stuff. So you'll see, it's the migration we've seen with all companies for the past 20 years. No. Yeah, and, and it doesn't help that I've been out for a few months last year. Yeah. But that couldn't be helped. So one of the interesting things the, the ARM side is driving is this whole big dot little architecture mm -hmm. where all of a sudden we do not have symmetric multiprocessing anymore. And as far as I can tell, our scheduler wasn't really designed for asymmetric you know, heterogeneous <coughs> multiprocessing. Are we going to be able to incorporate that? I think so, because um, at some point it's not really all that different from um, a symmetric system where you've got an asymmetric load due to, for example, real-time tasks or interrupt load. We already subtract the uh, time available to regular tasks uh, that's taken up by real-time or, or interrupt load. And um, due to that, you get a skewed um, fairness perspective on the regular tasks as well. Um, the big little system is, of course, different than that, but I think there's enough similarities to reuse a lot of that work. The one weird thing about Big Little is everybody focused on the speed and the, process, the power that the CPUs were taking up. But it turns out if you're running a small CPU that switched to the Little, you still have to have your memory running and your bus running and everything else. And those actually take up more power than your CPUs do. So I don't think it's a model that hopefully we won't, we'll see in the future. I don't think, I think it's an experiment that's failing. Just from the power physical layer, the electrical guys are saying. Well, well I don't know. Yeah, I don't No, I've think not heard that either, so we can take a look afterwards. <laughs> afterwards, we can have that discussion. But Actually, I, um, um, I'm, I'm an electric, electrical engineer, so <laughs> I know, and memory and buses are way beyond CPU power. Yeah. So uh, they take more, right? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Right, but it depends how much you're using the, the interconnect, right? So if you've got a coherent well, well, you're always memory. using memory. Yeah. You cannot put the memory in self-refresh if you're actually running something. Right. What's right, exactly. really eating up your power is I.O. pads and stuff. Yeah. You are using, world. Exactly. Yeah. So, Will, do we have proof that Big That Little is worth it then? <laughs> well, but, I mean, we'll see what people build. Uh, people certainly are, are taping out with these, these systems. They're putting them into products. Like, they wouldn't do that if they didn't think it worked. So. Right. Um, yeah, it's true. Okay. More in general, I guess, you know, especially for, for the more arm-oriented folks, there, there have been certainly a lot of complaints in past years, mostly from far past years, the kernel is really developed for the needs of the enterprise computing world. Um, you know, do you believe that's true? And if so, are there pain points that that's causing for you? Or, or is it as open to, to other uses as well? So I think that it probably has come largely from that background. And I think a lot of, a lot of the initial decisions and perhaps uh, initial maintainers, all the maintainers that are there now, were put in place by enterprise. Um, but I, I personally haven't had uh, too much issue with that. But again, I work largely under ArchArm, ArchArm 64, and drivers. I, I bug fixes mainly if I'm doing MM or kernel. Um, I think that Linux is the, the main uh, selling point of Linux is that it, it works everywhere. So it runs on all these devices. And if it's running more on mobile, um, and it is running you know, more and more and more on mobile, then perhaps that'll start to get some, some more swing into those areas. But, I mean, you have said that over the time, I mean, what we have in our pockets now really was the enterprise system of five or ten years ago anyway. So all that work those enterprise companies did is totally what embedded is now. Yeah, all these phones you're carrying are far more powerful than the i386 Linus ever started with. So, so yeah, so that IBM's NUMA and S&P work has paid off for ARM. Yeah. <laughs> and I also say it's, it's rare that you get put in a situation where you have choice X, which is make the core code really good for embedded, and the opposite choice is make it really good for enterprise. That doesn't tend to happen. Normally, you, you air your concerns, and there's a compromise sort, and actually, it tends to work pretty well, I think. I guess related to that, I recently heard Tim Bird air a complaint that we're no longer interested in really small systems, because even our really small systems are fairly big now, and that as a result, we're perhaps going to miss out on opportunities in the whole internet of things. and all that sort of stuff. 
Are, are we getting too big? To, are we, have we lost interest in really small? I don't think so. You still see the occasional blotometer patch come by. Um, Boris Love showed me one only today for somebody stripping out x86 features, shrinking the kernel. Um, there were some people recently suggesting we remove UP support or at least strip down UP support in that we make it look more like SMP, allocate all the SMP structures and do all that just to uh, unify the code a bit more. Um, but given that Intel is still producing new 32-bit UP CPUs with the Quark stuff or what have you, and ARM is still doing UP stuff, um, so it is still relevant. We actually just merged, um, I can't remember if it was 3.11 or 3.10, but we merged support for M-class cores, which are the really, really, really small uh, ARM chips, I think there was one where you, it was like the size of a full stop and it had a solar panel on it and it could power itself. And Okay, you probably wouldn't run Linux on that, but we've just made support for that. And um, I mean, that, that's going to be the, the type of stuff I think you might see in the Internet of Things. The trick is having enough RAM because the RAM requirement is still quite high for these guys. You might only have 16K and you can't run in that, but people find hacks, they run it in the frame buffer and you get a nice picture of whatever the hell Linux decides it's doing at that time. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean, we are, people are running mainline on those now. But I think as long as people want to run it and, and are willing to put the time and effort in, it, we, it shouldn't be too hard to keep it up. I mean, once UP really is gone, it'll bit rot very, very quickly. Okay. Um, I can't wait for the day, but <laughs> 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 I'm afraid I'll have to wait a long time. All right, let's, I'm gonna shift topics just a little bit. One of the perhaps more controversial things that the Kernel Summit Committee did this year was to open up a few slots for people um, who identified themselves as hobbyist developers, people who, who develop on their own time. How many of you out there in the audience have contributed a patch to the kernel at some point or another? So, I don't know, a fair percentage, maybe a third. How many of you have done it as, as an unpaid hobbyist sort of developer or started that way? Quite a few of you. <laughs> um, Right, if you look now from as best Greg and I can tell, something over 80% of the people contributing to the kernel are paid to do so. But there are people who do it on their own time, one of whom is on the stage here with us. So um, I would like to start by asking, um, why do you do it? Um, when, when you're surrounded by people who are being paid to, to do that and so on, what, what, what drives you to, to use your own time to, to work on the kernel? Okay, first of all, it's interest. I like to discover the electronic devices and the SOC layout. But maybe I'm not that prototype of hobbyist because I'm a hardware engineer, I'm, I'm, I'm building the SOCs, um, so I know what's going on inside. And part of my job is to write drivers for the hardware I've just built. Uh, so. Um, I translated that to my personal interest in, in tiny devices, and it started all with ARM, or maybe earlier, consumer electronic devices. You open them up, and you find some interesting pins, and you find access, and then you start just looking at the kernel, how should it work, and how can I make it do things I, I want to. That's the way. And then you, you're asking questions on the mailing lists, and if you are lucky, somebody answers, and uh, <laughs> you're fine, you're in. Is, is our community friendly to hobbyists? Do you get the answers that you need, or do you run into troubles there? Well, it depends on, on your um, way to start the contact, of course. Uh, the, the people in the mailing list are there long, long way before you've um, just realized that there is a mailing list. So <clears throat> if, you, if you start kindly, they will accept anything. You can be wrong, they will correct you. And probably they have made it a thousand times before with other people, because I'm not following the whole discussion. Um, but in general, it is friendly, yes. Um, from the other side of the coin, um, ask specific questions. They're easier to answer than the open question on how do I do yeah. blah. So ask specific, always ask on list, if you mail me privately, you're on a very short path to death, no. Uh, um, so, 
That's, uh, and I generally try and answer. I don't always get around to it, but I do try. Yeah, I'd say if you don't get a reply as well, don't feel too disheartened. Maybe mm -hmm. ping it again after a week, not, not immediately, because yeah. there's a lot. But the, the, the traffic currently on Linux ARM kernel, right, which is just for our charm. Well, our charm 64, but there's not many developers there yet. Uh, for our charm, it's, I don't know, I think we're eight or 9,000 mails a month just for the architecture stuff. So it's, it's not that many of us. Well, we all try and review it, but it's, it's definitely more people writing code than reviewing code, which I think is a common problem. How many of you do read the full mailing list at this point, or anything even close to it? I have trouble just keeping up with the inbox. Yeah. <laughs> I, I read everything, all the mailing lists I do, except for Linux kernel. I filter Linux kernel. Read all the subjects. <laughs> read the subjects. Yeah, there's some things. But other, uh, my subsystem mailing list that I have, I read all of those. So those, those are smaller, much less traffic. And that's the way with most maintainers of subsystems. They'll read, if you figure out where your question is, it's a much smaller group of people to ask and a much tinier mailing list. And those are usually always maintained pretty well, hopefully. But yeah, yeah, it is. Um, the the um, ARM Kirkwood, um, the ARM Marvel SOC people, they find um, um, emails on the list. They answer. Mm -hmm. Good. But that works, that works but, quite well, because if you pick something out, then you probably get CC next time around. So. Yeah, but using a, um, a suitable subject hmm. is helping. Yeah. So if you write Kirkwood, the maintainer will find it easy. If you miss to write the, uh, the, the correct um, <clears throat> SOC name or whatever, it's difficult. It's a lot of mails. I skip days of mails. <laughs> So you know, when you look at where our con contributions to the kernel come from, um, one of the steady trends that I've been observing is, is a decline in the percentage coming from, from volunteers, from hobbyists. And so I've been trying to figure out why that is and whether that's a problem or not. So any thoughts on why we might be getting less from volunteers? We is the absolute number uh, shrinking or is the relative number shrinking? Percentages, percentages going down. So look at, the, uh, look at the absolute numbers. It could just be that there is just that many more paid people and that the absolute number of people contributing on their free time isn't actually dropping all that much. But, but I'd say one thing that has gone down is time to market for mobile devices. That's really short, a lot shorter than it used to be. So these companies are paying a lot of money to software engineers to get BSP support to get drivers in. So well, perhaps that it's the, the number of But also, I mean, up. if you do five patches, you will get a job offer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, <laughs> I know five, at least five people who started off with tiny um, coding style fixes in the staging direct driver that now have full-time kernel jobs. I mean, if you want a job, I mean, seriously, it's usually been offered. I mean, you already have a job, so you have, <laughs> I don't know, but I mean, we have, it's really hard to find kernel people for a lot of companies, so they mine the list, they ask us, they ask me all the time, so I mean, seriously, if, I think it's that people just get hired, but that's my. Well, some of them clearly are. So. Some of them are, I know some of them are, so, yeah, which is kind of sad because we get them maintaining drivers and they get hired in a way and they do something else and they're not maintaining that driver. That's a personal problem, not Linux is fine. <laughs> or they get reassigned to a different project. Yes, they do. Yeah, yes, that, that gets happened a lot. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> Seems to happen a lot. Matthew Garrett yesterday talked about how he merged a bunch of buggy code and then got hired to do something else. <laughs> um, and just sort of left it behind. And I saw you complaining about somebody who merged some code and then their mail bounced. Yes, they, they, they weren't with the company anymore. Contributor. And so on. What kind of persistence do we want to try to insist on? How can we be sure that people will be around to maintain their code in well, this environment? I mean, the problem as a maintainer of accepting somebody's code, that is, if you disappear, I have to now maintain that. So it's, it's for one-off, for bug fixes and what, that's not an issue, but if I'm going to accept a major body of code, I need to trust that you're going to be around to resolve it, or I have to take that. So I mean, the famous example is with the networking code a number of years ago. They merged a big, hairy piece of code, and literally the day after that was accepted, the email address disappeared off the web. And it took Dave Miller and the network guys, I think, six to eight months backing all that out and fixing the problems. So it's really hard to get core networking changes in for that reason. I mean, you have to be around to do this work. We, the work and the body of code keeps increasing. My ability to do stuff is fixed, so you need to 
become part of the community in a way that then you know I can trust you to be around. I mean, the kernel development's a web of trust. I trust people not necessarily that they got it right, but they'll be around to fix it if it's wrong. It's that simple. So. Okay, I don't know if people have been filling What's out that? sheets with questions oh. on them. I'm certainly, maybe someone could bring them if we have some. Um, otherwise, I'll continue to. I'll continue to ask my own while I'm looking at these. Um, let's talk a little bit about device trees um, because that's, <laughs> that's an area of interest. A lot of the hardware that we have anymore is not like our nice PCs where you can simply ask every device, what are you? And it will tell you, right? A lot of the hardware that is being made now does not describe itself. So you have to give it a description externally. And the, the solution that's been adopted for that is a data structure called a device tree. I know Linus's in. opinion of the uh, <laughs> subject. <laughs> that's about all. So we're starting to run into trouble with device trees because uh, device trees are seen by some as a form of ABI that we should not break them as the kernel progresses. And we are breaking them. And we have various other issues with inconsistencies and so on. So the folks here who've worked with device trees and such to start with, uh, is device tree the right answer? What have we done wrong? How can we fix that? So I'll start with a caveat. <laughs> and that is that um, the R mini summit, which is going on now and tomorrow, is currently in the middle of a heated debate about this stuff. And it's continuing over two days. Uh, Greg and I have just been talking about this very topic. And we were arguing against each other. So <laughs> and certainly nobody has a, a complete agreement on what we should do about device trees. Um, I was there. I started kernel development, I don't know, maybe a year or two before we started doing device tree. And I think that the amount of code going in since then has gone up astronomically, and it, we couldn't have stuck with where we were. So device tree has definitely been an improvement in that regard. I think it's, it's allowed a lot of SOCs to be supported. It's allowed a lot of drivers to go in. It's allowed a lot of uh, code to go in as well. And we have also consolidated a lot of subsystems while we're at it. People will argue that we could have done that without device tree, but I think the two are probably uh, quite linked there. When it comes to ABI, yeah, that's a religious issue. I mean, we're still, there are some people that are absolutely saying it's unstable, don't, don't even think about putting it in a product. And then there are other people saying it's, you know, ABI, you can't change it at all. And they are, they are people that have a lot of respect within the ARM community, and they just, there's just a fundamental disagreement. Hopefully, we'll iron that out in the mini summit. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, um, the ABI stuff, the stable stuff, is very hard for uh, hobbyist contributors. Mm -hmm. I, I have a SOC. I find that uh, one IP is using Synopsys Designware, off-the-shelf IP. Mm -hmm. You write some device tree support, and then you, you have to invent a device tree, if it's ABI, that will be sufficient for every possible variation of this IP. <laughs> and you've just started to look into SOCs. <laughs> yeah. But now you're forced or asked to um, think of every possible way to connect this IP. And it's hardware. Uh, you know that you can connect it in a million ways. And, and they'll break it in two million ways. <laughs> yeah, and you will find somebody who didn't understand why not to do it this way. But they did. And there's also been a, a big trend to take what we had before, right? Which is lots of static data in the driver and simply cut, cut that out and then paste it into device tree. So you have like property and there's some like Linux hash to find and they put the number in. That's really not what it's supposed to be about. It's supposed to be the, the, the phrase that gets thrown around is it's supposed to describe the hardware, although I think people are now backing away a bit from that. So it's, it's, it's very much uh, changing at the moment. And it's hard for, uh, as a driver maintainer, I don't know what, if it's correct or not. Yeah. I'll know, if they said it worked, great, I'll take it. And that's been a big problem because it wasn't right, and it wasn't the right <laughs> schema, and it wasn't, but I had no way of knowing that. So the number of people that actually know what it should and shouldn't look like is very tiny, and it, we need a big education effort just for kernel maintainers and developers. And that hopefully, after the two days, we'll have something to hash out. But as long as you, as you see the device tree as a replacement for the platform data, like the resource management and, or naming resources, interconnecting modules or devices, whatever. I think that is fairly compatible and, and not affecting drivers at all. Right. Because the resources are passed automatically. You can write a driver that will be supported by a device tree a node and not knowing of it in any way. But but, I, yeah, but someone's like, oh, you used the wrong name for the 
for the company because it didn't match the name of the company's yeah. theory, and then we get argued. Yeah, so it's like stupid things that I don't even know about. Well, usually, I, I usually choose the marketing name because that's what what's, uh, they are publishing. Right. And that's all you would know, right? Yeah, so, of yeah. But then other people would say, use a different name. And, yeah, yeah gets, gets, Marvel just did. Oh, they did? <laughs> yeah, uh, I started uh, the work on the Berlin SOCs, which are in the Chrome, Chromecast and the Google TV devices. And um, at some point, at the, the patches I've sent, they said, oh, please name this BG2 or something. And remove all Amada marketing names. And I said, I, I can't. <laughs> That's the name everybody will look for. <laughs> There's still work. Yeah. <laughs> There's still work to be done on that. Uh, just the other day, I saw a fairly detailed critique from Russell King, the top level arm maintainer, yep. about the device <laughs> tree abstraction. And I didn't really have the time to understand it, except that it seems to have a lot to do with the interrelations between devices, yep. which I found is already hard because a lot of device drivers aren't driving a device anymore. Instead, you have a collection of devices and buses between them and so on, and you have to That's what we've just been piece it about. together <laughs> and, um, and make it work right. So, is there a fundamental flaw there that we haven't? I don't, I mean, we have these complex devices, especially in, I mean, the Video for Linux guys have been doing this for years, where you have different ways to hook up and make a core that makes a video, for, a video device. And now we're seeing it in other types of devices and then graphics devices. And that, do we describe those interconnectivity of all these weird SOCs or weird IP blocks as a way in device tree? Or do we do it somewhere else? Because we mean, have to describe it somehow. So, yeah, so what's wrong with making it all discoverable? That's, well, that's another story. <laughs> so for years, the core kernel people have been saying, make things discoverable and that. And then for years, hardware people have not been doing that. And but we have to support what they make. Obviously, <laughs> but why can't we just take them out back and make them do stuff? <laughs> that, you missed our talk about an hour ago. <laughs> I think that was your conclusion. That was my conclusion. <laughs> that, but um, yeah, so that's a problem. But so, I mean, maybe device tree isn't applicable. I mean, Russell's big objection was for this very complex 3D graphics chipset. It's all hooked together in weird ways. And how is that something we even want to describe in device tree? I don't, I don't know. Maybe that's something we shouldn't be. And you, I think actually it goes further than that, because even if we did have an ideal way of describing this to the kernel, there are still perhaps some issues with how we, how we deal with buses or how we, the, the whole driver model can't deal so well with if we've got uh, multiple instances which all have to kind of talk to each other. Right. And the driver model is known for having problems. Yeah. I, I did that, so <laughs> it has problems. Um, but yes, but we can, and maybe we need to fix things there, and we can change it. So. Well, the it's a tough problem. The alternative that we're, we're seeing is sometimes a lot of this gets punted, and then the hardware knowledge gets pushed out into user space instead. You see that you know, in video for Linux with the media controller thing, where you really have to know what it is you're connecting. You see it with ION, where you have to know what the memory requirements are for yeah. DMA buffers. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see more of that. Is our hardware getting to the point where we just can't solve it generically in the kernel? I don't think it's unsolvable. Um, I just think it's not nice to think about and not nice to solve. And it's nice to pretend that it's somebody else's problem. And I, I think that actually. You gave an example of pushing it into user space. It's also pushed into firmware, right? So we push it in both directions, just we don't want to keep it in the kernel. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are certainly cases now, as we were discussing earlier, that where the kernel actually needs this information as well. It, it won't be able to operate correctly without it. So uh, particularly more complex systems with interrupt routing and things like that, um, like dynamic interrupt routing, cache coherent interconnects, all this kind of stuff, where the kernel needs to know it. And, but I mean, we're covering, I mean, hardware now is a really a plug and play design model. You buy an IP, buy a core from somebody, you buy another core from somebody, buy another core, and you stick it together in your device and you ship it that way. And we have drivers for those individual cores, but now we have different drivers that need to talk in different ways. So now we need to come up with more flexible ways of doing that the way the hardware guys have already solved. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough problem on our side to do. So. Maybe somebody has to, whether you push it to user space or kernel, somebody still has to, has to do it. So it's not like it's going to not happen. It's tough. We have a job for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we shouldn't complain at the hardware developers too much because they do. No, they do. Yeah, no, no. I mean, the <laughs> discoverable, stuff to discoverable do. buses, yes, it's really easy. Just make a discoverable bus, guys. I mean, it's really <laughs> simple. Intel, I mean, years ago, we told Intel to do it, and they tried, and they almost got it right. 
<laughs> for some of the really tiny embedded stuff. But it's just make us some static tables and we'll read them and then we'll find. But in our discussion an hour ago, somebody's saying, well, those static tables in the chip will be wrong. How do we fix that? It's like, well, then fix the hardware. And so then we're responsible for fixing the hardware bugs. Right. But anyway. how, many, how many buses are discoverable? Lots. I can. How, how, okay, how sorry. Not as many as there are embedded buses. <laughs> like I2C, SPI, or... I2C is not, but S I mean, PCI, USB, S SPI, no. Yeah, maybe that's mm -hmm. it. But so PCI is a good example. You can use... Intel did this. They used the PCI headers as a discoverable way, and it's just some static memory we're reading that yeah. describes the hardware behind it. So yeah. you, you, can, you know how to enumerate the number of devices you have there. That's all we need. It just needs something simple, static tables, the way old um, Intel processors used to start up, we had static tables to describe the memory layout and all those fun things. Give us Which that. was sometimes wrong. It was sometimes wrong, and we couldn't <laughs> believe in that, but you've got to start somewhere. Right? Right. But people don't want to put a PCIe host controller in there. Like no, you don't need a PCIe host controller. <laughs> it's just a static table that looks, I mean, Intel did this. It looks like PCI. It just gives you some memory, some values you read out, and you go. And they wrote a little tiny stub driver that... And it read it, and away you went. Well, actually, even uh, if, if I design a, a system at work and put it into an FPGA, mm -hmm. I have the static table there. It's lost after synthesis, right? Because I don't put it in hardware. If I could. So maybe, I think the, yes. the TI yeah. guys did something uh, called HW mod, which kind of did something like that. I think it should slipped we, in the RTL. Should the we design. talk to the, the hardware designer tools people? Mm. Well, as a hardware designer, is it easier just to randomly hook up pins, or is it easier to... The address map? So, so uh, you decode addresses and say... Um, but but they, they, you use tools like, like VHDL compilers and all that Which stuff. is a language, yeah. Yeah, so why don't we fix the tools they use to automatically do what we want it to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you need to talk to uh, Synopsis or Cadence, I guess. Maybe we do. That's well, a good idea. That's a really good. We'll, I don't think we'll, nobody's thought of that. We'll look for your patch, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're getting through. But yeah, yes. we're, we're we're drifting off. I'm I'm going to switch to an audience question. A total change of, of context now. This is one some of us have heard before, but it comes out often enough. I think we might as well ask it and deal with it. So um, brace yourselves. SE Linux is a critical part of the kernel when it comes to security. I believe the NSA, the U.S. National Security Agency, has a big contribution to SE Linux. And the question is phrased, are you still happy with the NSA? But I suspect that what they're really asking is, are we really happy with SE Linux? Do we trust it? Whatever. It's, so I'm it's a royal that. pain, and I always disable it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, so I, I merged the Linux security model years ago, and we created that as a way that Linux didn't have to rely on only one security model, because the SE Linux guys were proposing this be the Linux security model. So there are ways to plug in different security models. So SE Linux is one, and if you like it, I think it works really, really well. Um, it's known to be a good description for solving the problem it wants to solve. And that's, I think it's good code. Um, whether you trust it or not, I mean, it's user unfriendly in many ways, and lots of people disable it, but lots of people run it. It's not, it's an access control type thing, so. I don't know, it works. Other people don't use different, I mean, there's the App Armor model, there's a lot of other models, the security models out there that you can use. The SMAC is being used now in shipping devices. That's a different model. So there's different, depending on what you want to do, use trusted different models. Um, but these guys that wrote the code, they're still part of our community. They've been around for years, and I think they're trusted known members of the kernel community. Yeah, also consider how many people are employed by the NSA. We don't know. No, but, I mean, yeah. it's, it's huge, and, and these few people are, yeah, we know them. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. The NSA has two hands. There's a protection side and a right. So this, these guys, protection these side. guys did come yeah. from, because the government does rely on Linux, and they wanted, they came from the mode of, we want to be able to use Linux for our own systems and protect our own systems using this type of stuff, and protect other parts of the government and other companies, because it is, if you have a known secure infrastructure, it's, that's a good thing to have. And they came out of the protection side. That's where these guys came from. So in general, um, I mean, I had some stuff related to this because security and um, such is a lot on people's minds. So I'd sort of like to ask, one, what is our responsibility with regard to delivering secure systems, a secure kernel to people? Certainly we can't, at the kernel level, secure the entire system. But we have our piece of it. Um, and are we doing that well enough, or how could we be doing it better? 
Exactly. We can always do better. Right. The fun thing, I mean, Linus and I argue, it's what is determining what is and is not a security bug. And that's another issue. I mean, as a responsibility, I'm part of this kernel. There's a security at kernel.org alias. Um, our goal is if you report a problem, we will fix it as soon as possible. I mean, that's the best that we can ever do, is if we find a bug, we will fix it as soon as we possibly can. And I don't know a better way to do anything other than that. Yeah, and when writing code, we just try and apply best practices. And I mean, I'm not a security expert. I'm not ingenious or nefarious enough to actually do a lot of these things. And, and I'm surprised always by the ingenuity of some of these exploits. Oh, they're great. Um, and, and I try and learn from them and uh, try and avoid these, these traps. But um, yeah, it's like Greg said, we're all young, we all make mistakes, and the best we can do is try and fix them. We got a good, I mean, there's people doing research on static code analysis tools. I mean, Julia and Dan have fixed more bugs in the kernel than anybody with doing static analysis tools that are really fixing security bugs. So there's some really good stuff, and now those are being run through automatic testing. So any new code that gets checked into the kernel is automatically run through these static analysis tools, and those bugs of known problems in the past are now fixed. So as long as we continue to learn from our past mistakes, I think that's the best we can do. And there's ongoing research. Julia is a professor in the university, and she's doing really good work in that area. So um, yeah, I think we're doing the best we can. If anybody knows other ways we can do things better, let us know. We're open for that. We should do. Because we're running everything now. This <laughs> is scary. <laughs> OK, related question, I guess. The very last 3.0 update came out this, this very morning, yes. I noticed. <laughs> The, the stable updates for the 3.0 kernel added up to something on the order of 4,000 fixes that went into that kernel over the course of two years. So one could argue that we released a stable kernel, heavily used, with 4,000 known bugs in it. Well, I mean, known after the fact, not known at the time. Um, so once again, are we doing as good as we can? Um, you know, why are there that many things to fix? Well, I don't know what, what's the alternative. That's like, we're not adding, you have to trust us that we're not adding bugs deliberately. Um, and some of those fixes were adding new device IDs. And we did add, we backported some major new things. But that was, you're right, it was fixes. There were fixes that were done. But I mean, these were things we learn over time that we did it wrong. I mean. So will 3.10 have fewer fixes by the time it goes unsupported? Proportionally, no, because it's a larger code base. And now I'm doing it, I'm also doing it full time now as part of what work at the Linux Foundation was the first year of 3.0, that was my hobby of maintaining it. So I wasn't finding all the patches and finding the pieces that needed to get backported into it. I think 3.10 is going to have more because there are more people going to be relying on that kernel for a long period of time than 3.0 was. 3.0 was a neat experiment in seeing if we can do this in a two year manner. But if you look at the number of fixes that are, affect a kernel over time, it, after a year, it starts dropping off, and then two years, it, it hits the floor almost. If you look, there was eight patches in the last release, while there was, in the three, last 3.10 kernel, there was almost 100. And that's, with a week, that's a week worth of fixes. So the number of things that are applicable over time have fallen off. But also, a lot of the patches where we know there is something wrong, but the fix is, is so big that we try not tell Linus, hey, pull this at RC7. And then we, we let it cook for RC1 or RC2, and then uh, pull it into stable if it turns out it actually works. The IPC worked recently. That so. was a big one. We, we, changed, we fixed a lot of bugs in IPC, and it ended up being like 40 patches that got backported to 310, which they went in over two kernel releases, and then they finally all chuckled back in. And the SUSE guys did a really good job of developing that and backporting it. So. I don't know, yeah. yeah I mean, 4,000 patches. One way to improve the metric is not to backport fixes, right? But yes. I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. So people have to deal yeah, with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a trade-off versus, versus stability. We'll yeah. <laughs> it, it's a trade-off versus stability of not ever changing anything versus fixing things, which implies changing stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, the world changes also. I mean, some of the things are things that people have never done before at the old time. So, I mean, things change over time. Processors speed up, we have other, oh, we have timing issues in this area now because they weren't there before. I mean, Linux changes because the world changes. If we stop changing, if our rate of change stops, then we are dead. I mean, it's that simple because the world continues to change. I mean, old OSs are there because their environment never changed and they're sadly dead. And I don't want Linux to die, so we're gonna have to keep changing. 
one one uh, um, <coughs> one thing is uh, IP is reusable, so they reuse it over years, over tens of years. Um, the the Marvel socks sold today have uh, Ethernet cores sold in PowerPC system controllers. I don't know when, 15, 10, 15 years ago. And it's the same driver, it's the same IP. And they get features. The driver doesn't know of the features, but it breaks the new IP the way it was written before. So yes, the world changes, and at least they, they get fixed. You get fixes. <laughs> So to sort of circle back to the previous topic, well, you said that, that we're not introducing bugs deliberately. Yeah. How do we know that nobody I knew is you introducing would bugs that. deliberately? Because <laughs> oh. so there, there are some worries about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't believe we've ever caught anybody trying to do that, other than the really heavy-handed thing in 2003, which no, was stupid. never going to work anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't believe we've ever caught anybody trying to do that. Um, well, the whole, the whole we, Linux... Uh, maintainership model for the kernel, I'm sorry, it relies on trust between maintainers. Um, and if we don't have that trust, then the development system breaks down. So it, that's the backbone of it. You, you trust the people that uh, you're pulling from. And essentially, that, that's what we rely on. So we we're not, we'd think that we're not adding things deliberately. If somebody tries to add a bug deliberately, then hopefully it will be spotted. Who knows if anyone ever has, right? But if it doesn't get spotted immediately, one would hope that it gets spotted later on. I think if you look at the, the known exploits we've had over the time, they can, as far as I know, all be traced back to just stupid problems where we yep. messed up. I mean, that, nothing's ever been figured out. I mean, I know I've introduced lots of bugs that have been fixed, but yep. I just messed up. <laughs> yeah, we all have. It's just part of code. So, but, I mean, people who have analyzed our code base do know that we have the least number of bugs per line of any known code base. So... I guess we're doing better than everybody else, but it's hard. It's a hard problem. It's interesting. And there's a tons of research out there to do. If you're looking for a master's or PhD thesis, please, there's people doing that. And that's good stuff to work on. It's a good thing to study and help us. Even at the, the lowest defect rate, I, mean, I think it's pretty easy to argue that we introduce enough bugs that there's no need for anybody else yes. to, <laughs> to try to deliberately do it because that's just part of how, how things work. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we won't have trouble with that. But when you see some of the things that slip through, you know, even in core code, um, you know, it's theoretically reviewed, it's really hard to catch things. Well, um, you know, they're just mistakes, not... Yeah, but then our model uh, shows... I, 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 mean, I we wish have a more model. people were reviewing my stuff. I mean, at some point... I mean, seriously, at some point, it's, it's very few people that are around who actually look at your code. Um, and some of the patches, I write them, Ingo merges them, and I don't think anybody ever looked at them. And yes, I do make mistakes, and I do get to clean them up, but... Um. Yeah, so you and Ingo looked at, I mean, a lot of stuff it can be traced to two or three people every line, but the fact that it can be traced is a very good, it's a personal ownership issue, so that's a good thing yeah. that we know we can go blame. I mean, I mean, it's a path of blame, these kernel patches, which is nice, so, yeah. But in fact, when I looked a few releases back, a significant percentage of the code going into the kernel had no sign-offs other than the author. Were those Nobody authors, else had signed off. Were those the authors code. subsystem maintainers? Um, often, oh. yeah, because they're the people who can actually right. pull that off. Yeah. Um, I mean, do we have a review problem? How, how can we get more review? Because you never have too much review. So on the, on the ARM list, I think we definitely have a review problem. Um, again, particularly where device tree bindings are concerned. So. We did establish a set of people to go and review device tree bindings, but it's not enough people. Some of them have since quit because there's too much email they're getting. They can't do anything else. Like they can't do their job. They can't go to sleep. <laughs> Just to, they're trying to review device tree all the time. So yeah, there is an issue with review. And the problem is that to get reviewers, you need the people who have all the expertise in that area. And they're either pulling code and dealing with it that way, or they're the ones that you want writing it. So it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to train people up. There's a bootstrap problem there. Yeah, that, and once you've trained them up, they leave. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have very few people that only do this as a full-time job, as a maintainer. I think there's a number. I mean, Dave Miller said maintainers are like editors. You end up working with other people's stuff and getting it working, and every once in a while you have a side project of your own, which is kind of annoying, but that's our job to do that. And yeah. Finding those people is hard. Reading code is a really good way to learn, so I try and get people to read code. 
In fact, reviewing code is one of the best ways to learn about kernel. It is, it really is. But I mean, I, I do think it's some, so I have a subsystem I wrote 10 years ago in the kernel, USB serial. I maintained it, I've maintained it since then. I wrote some new code for that. It took me four tries, because I got it wrong. But people reviewed it and rejected it and stuff, <laughs> and told me not to take it. So um, some subsystems are good. They do review that. So um, I was a proof of that it is still hard to get code in at times. <laughs> Okay, let, let's look far future for a moment. BSD, or OpenBSD in particular, recently fixed their, their year 2038 problem. Did when they did, they fixed it. <laughs> um, when when our, the, the internal time t variable runs out of bits and wraps around, happens in early 2038. Mm -hmm. um, we have not fixed that. Are we going to have a year 2000 type problem as we get closer to 2038? And I was always hoping that by then we'd use 64 bit CPUs. Yeah, I thought. Yeah. Well, I can I tell you there'll be some 64 32 bit, CPU, ones. bit CPUs solve that, right? Yeah, but okay. uh, will, will, will we have no 32 bit CPUs in. Well, Intel just came out with a 486 new chip. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I met one of the guys, like, yeah, I did that design 20 years ago. So. Yeah, we're still shipping billions. Yeah, you have billions. <laughs> I don't know. That's a tough. Somebody needs. I don't know. We can come back for, out of retirement and fix it, right? <laughs> I don't know. Should, I don't know. I mean, it was obviously somebody's issue that it should be fixed, so maybe we, somebody yeah, should look at I mean, OpenBSD fixed it by breaking their user space API. Yeah. Ooh. So and, for us, you know, they, they can do that they because do that. they have everything together and don't care about anything else. <laughs> That's true. Um, we do care. We care a lot. So we have to do something clever, which suggests that perhaps we should be thinking about it. So I, I, I did yeah. talk to the, some of the toolchain guys about this, and they're really keen on breaking the ABI because there's a whole lot of stuff they want to get in for Libc and some unwinding stuff. So I, I think, to be honest, that's what will happen. Um, there will be a new ABI. Yeah, that would be we, we, on our, in our land, we rolled, we rolled a new ABI for, for hard float relatively recently, and you have to go and you know, rebuild stuff. So I think that's what will happen. The problem will be that people are deploying devices now. In, I don't know, satellites or weather stations or something, which probably are going to be still ticking when 2038 rolls around. So. Well, we have stuff that we know have to be supported for 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's going into traffic lights. Linux yep. is in traffic lights. But at least with the traffic lights, you don't get that they run this old software on, on state of the art hardware. I mean, we've got people trying to run RHEL 3 on Haswell chips. Right. Now, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different, that's a totally different issue. <laughs> All right, so we haven't solved that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody's looking for something to do. <laughs> and you're willing to take a lot of darts. <laughs> that's a tough problem. That's, that's going to be a hard one. Um, OK, we're, we're running out of time. We have just a couple of minutes left. So I want to sort of talk a little bit, again, maybe futures about innovation stuff. Because we talked a little bit about device tree and how hard it is to get that stuff right and support it. Um, we have at least one known critic of control groups on, on the stage um, who is just like that sort of stuff. And that's been another interface that we got wrong both internally and externally. And internally we can fix it, externally it's harder. We're, we're blazing a lot of new paths now. We're doing stuff that no one's ever had to do before. And everything we do we end up committing to support. How can we do this? Are we going to end up carrying just tons of baggage and get buried under it? Uh, uh, What's the alternative? We I mean, tried it before. We've tried this. We've had this problem for the past 10 years, and it's, it's hard. Yeah. We I keep mean, talking about it. Even, even with, with simple things, you need to write it at least three times to get it sort of right. Now add the user interface. You'd have to try three user interfaces before you get it maybe right. It's, it's, but everybody it's a royal has this, everybody, everybody, Every OS's API changes like this. Windows does it. Solaris did it. I mean, they had official ways to deprecate things and stuff. And we've tried those official ways, and sometimes people yell at us and not to do it, and that's so good. Usually what we do is we create a second API, and then just wait for all the users of the old API to die and go away, and then we try and sneak the code out, and then somebody yells, but hey, I was still using that, and we go, damn. <laughs> <laughs> and then we put it back in and wait. Yeah, I mean, creating something brand new when you don't know how it's going to work over time is, is, a, is an insolvable problem. You know, you have to try it to figure out if it worked or not. And I think if you, if you tried to wait until you've got the perfect solution, we'd never have a solution. Yeah, so, I mean, you won't know enough, if it's worked. Yeah, if we it's have worked. enough developers who are committed to supporting this stuff and working on it that actually we can kind of get away with the way we're doing it at the moment. Yeah, because everything we're doing now is new. There's nothing, we don't have any model for what anything we're doing anymore. 
we're now the forefront, and it's hard up here. <laughs> hard but fun. It's fun, yeah. There's lots of cool and fun projects, but it's, it's something that is going to always happen. And we are now learning over the past five to six years of how to deal with that. And we argue and yell. And the thing is, we're doing it all in public. It's stuff you don't see other companies. I mean, I know Microsoft has rewritten core APIs and user space APIs three to five times over the years because of the same problem. New hardware comes out with different device models. You know, 100 gigabit Ethernet's coming. And what is they doing to the whole networking core? It's totally having to change again. Um, well, it seems, it seems like a high-quality problem to have. Yes, it's a good so, problem. I think we can do it. So the little clock is actually beeping at me. I don't know if you all can hear it. It's just that um, we've run out of time. So what I would like to do is to thank all of our panelists. Can you give them a hand?